like to welcome everybody here tonight. We are so pleased to have Professor Richard Rorty from Stanford. Uh, we have been sort of plotting getting him here. You didn't know this, right? <laughs> Since we heard that he arrived at Stanford, right? It, and so it was in our local area. We couldn't fly you from Virginia. Um, so, so this is wonderful. And I'd like to welcome all the other people uh, who are here from uh, the community and from other clubs. And uh, my friend Dave Danielson from the College of San Mateo. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, who else is here? Roger Hall. Right, you don't know Roger, but he's no, a uh, new um, faculty member in philosophy. Uh. And uh, uh, I wanted to say about this, you know our program here, we talk a lot about history of philosophy. Right? And if you go through some courses with us, you uh, eventually get to the point where uh, after hearing about arguments for the existence of God and free will and you know, all that stuff, right? Uh, consequentialism and non-consequentialism, et cetera, right? You ask, uh, what are they doing in philosophy today? And Don and I, when we answer this question, I suppose Barbara too, when we answer this question, we inevitably find ourselves talking about Professor Rorty. Uh, because he is doing very interesting stuff. He is addressing you know, the kind of dilemma of philosophy uh, today, which is kind of, what are they paying us for? I mean, the entire history of philosophy has seemed to be on a sort of suicide course, right? We started out thinking we could get you know, truth with a capital T and reality with a, you know, alpha reality, right? And goodness with a capital G, right? And the whole history of philosophy seems to have been you know, uh, a progressive, uh, more certain proof that you can't get any of that stuff, so what the, what do we do now? Um, and uh, at the same time, however, right, if we give up on absolutes, you know, we're not uh, very uh, comfortable with this uh, epistemologically anything goes. So uh, I've, uh, I've been very, uh, very helped, you know, by reading Professor Rorty's stuff on, on this, as well as um, the stuff he's written about uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger. Um, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time reading both of those people. Uh, and uh, uh, for obvious reasons, I guess. I mean, Nietzsche because of you know the stuff he says about women, and, and Heidegger because of the general unintelligibility problem. <laughs> but you know, uh, I have learned a lot about Nietzsche and Heidegger from reading uh, from reading stuff by Professor Rorty. Um, you can look on our website, right? For you know, you, there's a link to Amazon. Uh, when I went to Amazon looking up uh, uh, stuff by or about uh, Richard Rorty, something like 80 citations came up. You know, so. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, truly you know, a, uh, you know, a, a very world famous person. You know, on one of his books, uh, uh, one of the readers says that, that Professor Rorty is the most interesting philosopher in the world today. Right? So uh, it is with great pleasure that I present Professor Rorty. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Faith. I'm very grateful to Mr. Baim and the other members of the club for inviting me. If I can get the microphone under control, um, I will be talking on the topic, is there a conflict between religion and science? Science and religion are often said to be irreconcilable. The principal argument for this claim is that it's intellectually irresponsible both to believe in the existence of a benevolent and omnipotent creator of the universe and to accept the results of modern science. I'm dubious about this notion of intellectual responsibility. I think that William James and John Dewey showed us that that idea is less useful than it may seem. So in this talk, I'll be trying to restate some of James's and Dewey's arguments on the topic. To make the issue I want to discuss a bit more concrete, I ask you to consider an evolutionary biologist who is also a religious believer. Call this imaginary person Professor Ryan. Ryan spends her working hours figuring out how to bridge the gaps in Darwin's story of how the mammals, and in particular, the human beings came into existence. Her work is done against the background of, and takes for granted, the usual story about the history of the physical universe, the story first told by Lucretius and enlarged upon by Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. It's a story about elementary particles batting about without purpose, coming together accidentally to form stars, planets, protein molecules, and eventually everything else. God does not get into the act. 
On Sundays, Ryan goes off to Mass, recites the Creed, takes communion, and all the rest of it. She doesn't think much about the relation between her weekday and her Sunday activities. She was raised a Catholic, has never seriously considered abandoning Catholicism, and relishes the experience of communal worship. Ever since she realized that her oldest son was gay, she has had doubts about the church's views on various issues, and she regards the present pope as a bit too preoccupied with sex, but she figures that popes come and go, and the next one may be a bit better. Although she's married to an agnostic, her husband agreed that their children would be raised as Catholics. Her oldest son has stopped going to Mass and has, in a casual and offhand way, gone over to his father's agnosticism. This pains Professor Ryan somewhat, but not enough to cause a family crisis. She still hopes that her other children will stick by the faith of her father's. When her kids were studying the catechism, they would ask her the usual questions about just how God managed to create the world out of nothing, how Jesus managed to be both fully God and fully man, and how the consecrated host on the altar manages to be the divine substance while retaining its previous appearance. She shrugged the questions off. She has little interest in theology and is quite content to toss in the phrase mystery of faith wherever it will do the most good. Many people, like my fictional Professor Ryan, actually exist. Lots of people who see themselves as perfectly good, perfectly sincere believers in some standard version of Christianity or Judaism or Islam, nevertheless unquestioningly accept propositions such as those of the Darwinian theory of biological evolution, which many other believers think incompatible with the creeds of these, their respective faiths. These people are the despair both of their swaggeringly atheistical scientific colleagues and of the less liberal members of the clergy. Professor Ryan, for example, is well aware and rather amused by the fact that her parish priest would like her to take the Pope's pronouncements more seriously than she actually does. She's also well aware that her atheistical colleagues make jokes about her religious beliefs behind her back. She is equally insouciant about both. The question I want to discuss is, is Ryan behaving in an intellectually irresponsible way? If so, it's presumably because she makes no attempt to weave the beliefs relevant to her professional activities together with those which dictate her Sunday church going. Well, should she make such an attempt, and if so, why? It's not enough to answer this question by saying that it's a law of logic that one shouldn't hold contradictory beliefs and that we all have a moral obligation to think logically. For it's always possible, as St. Thomas remarked, to dissolve a contradiction by making a distinction. It may seem, for example, that I should not both accept the Copernican account of the heavenly bodies and still believe that the sun is moving steadily closer to the horizon, but of course I resolve the contradiction by distinguishing between the astrophysical and the common sense descriptions of the sun's motion. It may seem I should not both believe that there is wet bread on my tongue and that I am partaking of the very substance of my God, but I can resolve that contradiction by distinguishing between the theological and the common sense descriptions of what is going on. We make this sort of contradiction resolving distinction all the time. When the courts decide hard cases, for example, they make distinctions that nobody has ever drawn before in the hope of avoiding the charge that they're treating like cases in unlike ways. It's never easy to say when such distinction making is legitimate and when not. The same judicial opinion is often described with equal conviction and honesty as brilliant analysis and as disingenuous rationalization. When it comes to the purported clash between religion and science, however, it may seem difficult to wiggle one's way out of the appearance of contradiction. For surely the universe was either planned by an intelligent being, one concerned with our welfare and our actions, or it's a fortuitous assemblage of contingencies. It seems too simple to say that it can be described one way on Sundays for religious purposes and the other way on weekdays for all other purposes. Uh, 
The difference between the two ways of describing the universe seems too important to be shrugged off just by making a distinction between alternative purposes. Furthermore, the difference between these two descriptions doesn't seem analogous to the difference between the common sense and the scientific descriptions of the motions of the sun and earth. For in the latter case, we can escape contradiction by saying that it's handy and harmless to have two different vocabularies, one for everyday purposes and another for scientific purposes. The relation between statements made in these two vocabularies is not exactly contradictory, but just a matter of speaking crudely and speaking precisely. The crude way of speaking, which tells us that the sun moves across the sky, can be replaced with a more precise description of what's going on, a description which saves and explains the appearances. But the scientist who is also a religious believer can hardly say that either biology or the catechism is a crude, oversimplified, but convenient way of speaking, for the scientific and the religious vocabulary are equally refined and precise. Both purport to describe how we got here, where human beings come from. So one of them surely must be wrong. Anybody like Professor Ryan, many people would say, must be schizophrenic or at least intellectually irresponsible. One familiar way to defend people like Professor Ryan against this charge of intellectual irresponsibility has been to distinguish between literal and symbolic truth. Paul Tillich, great liberal Protestant theologian of the mid-century, said that the statements of science are literally true, whereas those of religious faith are what he called symbolic expressions of our ultimate concern, that is, attempts to describe whatever it is that we love with all our hearts and minds and strength. Tillich said that we all had symbols of our ultimate concern, only some of which were personalized deities, the revolutionary power of the proletariat is such a symbol for Marxists. The incarnation is such a symbol for Christians. The poetic imagination was such a symbol for Coleridge. Just as Marxists allow no empirical facts to spoil their image of the proletariat, and just as positivists allowed none to interfere with their images of physics and mathematics, so Christians allow no empirical facts to tarnish their sure and certain hope of resurrection. Tillich's point was the debate, that a debate between Marxists and Christians or between Marxists and positivists is not like a debate between advocates of Ptolemy's and Copernicus's theories about the notion, motion of the earth or like a debate between Darwinians and creationists. In the latter case, there's plenty of agreement about what phenomena need to be explained and room for debate about which explanation of those phenomena best meets certain familiar criteria. But in the case of the Marxists versus the Christians or the Buddhists versus the Hindus, it seems silly to try to get agreement on which phenomena need explanation or about criteria for satisfactory explanation. The whole idea of explaining phenomena seems out of place in reference to these disagreements. So, liberal theologians like Tillich say, let's think of religion and philosophy as dealing in symbols and science as dealing in facts. The same facts are compatible with the invocation of many different symbols. The typical response to Tillich's distinction between symbol and fact, a response made both by religious fundamentalists and by militant atheists, is to say that what Tillich called symbolic expressions are just factual claims for which there are no good arguments. Fundamentalists think that Tillich is an atheist who didn't have the courage of his convictions. Atheists think that he is a mere obscurantist. Both think that he's intellectually dishonest. I don't think that Tillich was intellectually dishonest, but I also don't think that his notion of symbol is particularly helpful. The cash value of the term symbolic seems to be merely irrelevant to prediction and control. That is, you know, the literal is the stuff in the science books that helps us deal with the environment, cure diseases, build bombs, stuff like that, the symbolic stuff in non-scientific books is not useful for that purpose, useful for some other purpose. 
Tillich's interpretation of theology as symbolic expression of, of Christian theology as symbolic expression of Christian concern merely reiterates the claim that theology nowadays mustn't try to compete with natural science in explaining how things have come to pass, how the human species got here, for example. Nor is it supposed to compete with science in predicting what will happen. Those days are gone. Once upon a time, in the 17th century, there were you know, the church and the new science offered competing predictive explanations. Now the church has given up on predictive explanation. That's why theology has become immune from empirical disconfirmation and why acquiring or losing belief in God is more like falling into or out of love than like winning or losing an argument. It seems to me more helpful to forget the literal symbolic distinction and just to say that nowadays, since the development of modern science, religious beliefs and scientific beliefs have become tools for doing different jobs. Scientific beliefs help us predict and control events in space and time. This job used to be done by cosmogonic hypotheses pervaded by priests and prophets, but it can now be done better. Religious beliefs give us a way of thinking of our lives which puts them in an emotionally satisfying context. Religion oversteps its bounds when it picks a quarrel with science, as when the Christian clergy picked quarrels first with Galileo and then with Darwin. Science oversteps its bounds when it tells us that we have no right to believe in God now that we have better explanations of the phenomena which God was previously used to explain. This way of reconciling science and religion requires one to abandon the idea that there is one way the world really is and that science and religion are competing to tell us what that way is. Abandoning that idea is easiest if one thinks of beliefs as tools for accomplishing a purpose rather than as attempts to represent the intrinsic nature of reality the way things are in themselves. Instead of insisting that there is such a way things are in themselves, one will hold that although there are alternative descriptions of things, descriptions useful for different purposes, none of these get closer to the way things really are than any other. On this view, the sole virtue of any descriptive vocabulary is its utility. It can't have a further virtue called getting things right. This view of the function of descriptions is at the heart of the pragmatism developed by James and Dewey. This technique of reconciliation also requires one to say that there is no such thing as the search for truth if that search is conceived of as something distinct from the search for greater human happiness. For all we know about truth on a James Dewey pragmatist view is that we call a belief true when we conclude that no competing belief serves the same purpose equally well. We want prediction and control and scientific beliefs give us that. We also want our lives to have significance. We want to love something with all our heart and soul and mind and philosophical and religious beliefs sometimes help us in that attempt. Different human needs give rise to different ways of describing ourselves and the world, and thus different candidates for belief. These candidates are, so to speak, running for different offices, and so they need not get in each other's way. These ways of thinking about truth, belief, and reality add up to the view of knowledge common to the American pragmatists to Nietzsche and to such post-Nietzschean European philosophers as Heidegger and Derrida, all these thinkers give up on the idea of reality as it is in itself, and therefore on the idea that the search for truth is an attempt to represent the intrinsic nature of things. They all deny that things have intrinsic natures as opposed to more or less useful descriptions. The view these thinkers share is sometimes described as social constructionism, but that's misleading. These philosophers are not saying that what we used to think was discovered is actually our own invention. 
Rather, they're simply reiterating that we can make no sense of the suggestion that one description of things is closer to the way things really are, apart from any human needs, purposes, or interests than some other description. The best we can do is to discover that one description is more useful for the satisfaction of one or another human need, but hardly for the satisfaction of all human needs. These philosophers all deny that truth is a matter of correspondence to the way things are independent of our needs, for they argue there is no way we could ever test for such correspondence. Any proposed test would have to compare the ways we talk about things with the way things are apart from being talked about, and we have no idea what such a comparison would look like. There are many objections to pragmatism and many defenses against these objections, today, but today I want to stick to what pragmatists have said about religion. In particular, I want to discuss the way in which William James replied to the claim that religious faith is intellectually irresponsible. In an essay called The Will to Believe, James responded to W.K. Clifford's version of this latter claim. Clifford was a 19th century science freak, positivist. He wrote, quote, if a belief has been accepted on insufficient evidence, the pleasure is a stolen one. It is sinful because it is stolen in defiance of our duty to mankind. It is wrong always everywhere and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence, end of quote. Clifford asks us to be responsive to evidence as well as to human needs. So the question between James and Clifford, I think, comes down to this. Is evidence something which floats free of human projects, or is the demand for evidence simply a demand for the satisfaction of one particular human need, the need for agreement in belief when engaged in cooperative social projects? James thought it was the latter. On his view, it's reasonable to demand evidence from those with whom we're engaged in a common enterprise, for example, when we're judges trying to make our country's laws hang together, but when we're engaged in private idiosyncratic projects, such as the search for meaning which leads us toward religion, literature, and philosophy, it's not clear that we have an obligation to produce evidence. James summed up his reply to Clifford as follows, quote, our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds." Close quotes. There are, James said, certain live, momentous, and forced options which people face and which cannot be decided by anything which Clifford would be willing to call evidence. An option is live, James's definition, if we can't help thinking about it, if we can't help feeling that it's important. Things, options that are live for some people aren't live for other people. One sense, people's sense of importance differs. It's momentous if, unlike the live option of going to the movies or staying home and working, decision between the alternatives will have far-reaching effects. It's forced if there's no way of splitting the difference, no way of fudging the issue. It cannot be decided on intellectual grounds if there is no consensus in the relevant community about what criteria should be used for arriving at a decision. What counts as a live, forced, and momentous option will vary from culture to culture and from individual to individual. Some people who were raised agnostic never think about religion at all, and for them the option of becoming a religious believer is simply not live. Yet it may become live if, for example, they fall in love with someone who refuses to marry a non-Catholic. There are no options which all human beings have a moral duty to confront because options vary with physical and intellectual location. Clifford, on the other hand, 
sees all human beings as confronted with one universal unvarying option, the option between facing up to the truth and blinding oneself to the truth. Our intellectual obligation to withhold belief in the absence of evidence is for Clifford linked to our moral obligation to acknowledge truth once evidence is present, an obligation which binds all human beings alike. What distinguishes us from animals for Clifford is precisely this obligation. The animals merely want to be happy, but we human beings, the rational animals, also want to know. To believe in the absence of evidence or to falter in the quest for truth by faltering in the pursuit of further evidence is to betray one's essential humanity. For pragmatists like James, on the other hand, to search for truth is to search for beliefs that work, for beliefs that get us what we want. So there's no big discontinuity between us and the animals. We just have bigger brains and better equipment than they do, and thus can enjoy more complex and delightful kinds of happiness than they can. One of these kinds of happiness consists in the sheer pleasure of finding beautiful comprehensive theories. Another is the better control over ourselves and our environment which such theories may give us, the sort of control we have after inventing anesthetics and airplanes, for example. Still another is the kind of happiness which their faith brings to the devout and which their lack of faith brings to exuberantly militant atheists. There is no obligation on all human beings to enjoy any of these forms of happiness. The whole notion of obligation is out of place in this area. When Professor Ryan looks for the best explanation of a puzzling biological fact, she is of course bound to look for an explanation which will be supported by evidence available to her fellow scientists. But on James's view, this is not because she is seeking truth as opposed to happiness. Rather, she is seeking for tools which will do a certain job that certain human beings have undertaken, namely putting together a comprehensive narrative of what spatiotemporal events were causally linked to which other spatiotemporal events, and in particular of how biological evolution works. When she expresses her contempt for Catholic fundamentalists who reject Darwin, Ryan is expressing contempt for people who try to use old tools when new and better tools for doing the same job have become available. When Professor Ryan attends mass, takes communion, and recites the creed, however, she is not taking part in a cooperative quest for the best solution to a practical problem. She is no more answerable to demands for evidence than she was when she decided whom to marry or when she decided what graduate training to take up. She is seeking happiness in her own way, on her own time, for her own sake. So much then for an outline of James's reply to Clifford. I think this reply is the right one to make to anyone who says that religious faith is intellectually irresponsible. James's reply amounts to saying that we have no responsibilities to something called truth, but only responsibilities to other human beings. The question of whether there is evidence for a belief is the question of whether there exists a certain human community which takes certain relatively non-controversial propositions as providing good evidence for, good, sorry, good reason for that belief. Where there is such a community, a community to, to which we want to belong or to continue to belong, we have an obligation to our fellow human beings not to believe a proposition unless we can give some good reasons for doing so. Reasons of the sort that the relevant community takes to be good ones. Where there is no such community, we don't. Nobody knows what would count as non-question begging evidence for the claims of the Catholic or the Mormon church to be the one true church. But that does not and should not matter to the Catholic or the Mormon communities. Biologists, on the other hand, know quite well what counts as evidence for Darwinism or for creationism. James, unfortunately, thought of the opposition between responsibilities to our fellow humans and to ourselves in terms of a distinction, in the passage I quoted, between 
intellectual grounds and emotional ground, emotional needs. I think that was a mistake. For that way of talking suggests a picture of human beings as having two distinct faculties with two distinct purposes, one for knowing and another for feeling. This picture has to be abandoned once, once one gives up, as James and other pragmatists do, the idea that there is a special human purpose called knowing the truth interpreted as getting in touch with the intrinsic nature of reality. It would be, would be better if James had thrown out this kind of faculty psychology, the kind that draws a nice clean line between reason and emotion, a picture and substituted something like a picture of human minds as webs of belief and desire, so interwoven with one another that it is not easy to tell when a choice has been made on purely intellectual grounds or on merely emotional grounds. Nor is it useful, it seems to me, and I think should have seemed to James, to divide areas of culture or of life into those in which there, are, there is objective knowledge and those in which there is only subjective opinion. These traditional epistemological distinctions are, as I see it, misleading ways of making a distinction between areas where we do have an obligation to other people to justify our beliefs to them and our desires and areas in which we don't have such an obligation. James's intellect-passion distinction should be replaced by a distinction between what needs justification and what doesn't. A business proposal, for example, needs justification, but a marriage proposal in our romantic and democratic society doesn't. That is, if, if somebody asks you to marry them, uh, you don't, you know, you say, you know, justify that proposal. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's not, that's not in point. If he asks you to invest, you, you know, it is in point to say, you know, why should I, what, you know, what is the probability of this, the probability of that, and so on. This replacement, my suggested replacement of James's terminology, uh, makes possible an ethics of belief less rigorous than Clifford's. This pragmatist ethics says with John Stuart Mill that our right to happiness is limited only by others' rights not to have their own pursuits of happiness interfered with. This right to happiness included what includes what James called the right to believe. More generally, it includes the rights to faith, hope, and love. These three states of mind can often not be justified and typically should not have to be justified <coughs> to our peers. Our only intellectual responsibilities are responsibilities to cooperate with others on common projects, projects such as constructing a unified scientific theory or a uniform commercial code or something of that sort, and not to interfere with their private projects. For the latter, projects such as getting married or getting religion, the question of intellectual responsibility just doesn't arise. James's critics will hear all this as an admission that religion is not a cognitive matter and that what James called the right to believe should better have been called the right to yearn or the right to hope or the right to take comfort in the thought that or something like that. But I don't think James should make that admission. Rather, he should insist that the impulse to draw a sharp line between the cognitive and the non-cognitive and between beliefs and desires, even when this explanation, this distinction is relevant neither to the explanation or the justification of behavior, is a residue of the old belief that we should engage in two distinct quests, one for truth and another for happiness. James would insist that there is nothing to the idea that religion is non-cognitive except the familiar point that it does not do what natural science does. It doesn't predict doesn't demand to see conflicting, to, to see confirming instances of universally quantified statements, doesn't hook up neatly with the other natural sciences, and so on. Clifford, as I've said, thinks that we human beings have an obligation to something non-human called truth with a capital T. James thinks that we have no obligations except to each other. 
For him, figuring out what to believe is a subspecies of figuring out what to do, so intellectual responsibility cannot be more than a species of moral responsibility. As Person James insisted, beliefs are habits of acting rather than attempts to represent reality. Some things we do are our own business, others are other people's business as well. The ethics of belief I have been suggesting or developing out of James's suggestions is, as I've already said, James's extension of John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. A utilitarian moralist will say, for example, that there cannot be anything wrong with any sexual act performed by two consenting adults. It is, the act is nobody's business but theirs. Analogously, a utilitarian ethics of belief says that the only point at which we have a right to criticize somebody's religious beliefs is when that belief is made an excuse for interfering with other human projects, as for instance when the clergy try to get in Galileo's or Darwin's way, or when religious people try to pass laws forbidding this or that sexual activity. The only point at which we can criticize somebody's atheist beliefs is when the atheists turn political, when, for example, as happened in southern Germany, Bavarian atheists insist that Bavarian public schools have to take down the crucifixes from the classrooms, crucifixes which have been hanging there for hundreds of years. The fact that Professor Ryan's atheist fellow scientist cannot imagine how she reconciles her weekday and Sunday activity shouldn't perturb her any more than the fact that her parish, any more than the fact that her parish priest can't imagine this either. She is doing neither her scientific discipline nor her church any harm, so neither has the right to complain. James dedicated his book, Pragmatism, to Mill, and one of the first books ever written on pragmatism called it Romantic Utilitarianism. But that characterization of pragmatism raises an interesting question. Mill's utilitarianism was often said by its 19th century opponents to be a godless, atheistic, materialistic creed. Those who take this view of utilitarianism and pragmatism will say that the religious should beware of pragmatists bearing gifts. In particular, they should beware of James's suggestion that anybody has a right to believe anything as long as their doing so doesn't compromise any cooperative enterprise to which they have committed themselves. These people will claim that utilitarianism is a view which could only be accepted by somebody who was already an atheist, or at least by somebody who had no religious feeling, somebody whose sense of human possibilities is narrow and blinkered, like Dickens's Mr. Gradgrind, parody of the utilitarian. This line of argument, however, presupposes that it's essential to religious faith to submit to the authority of something non-human. Insofar as religion consists in such submission to what is sometimes called a sacrifice of the intellect, then it is indeed the case that somebody who is religious can be neither a utilitarian or a pragmatist. But that seems a question begging definition of religion. If religious faith is defined narrowly enough so that it consists in a refusal to take part in some cooperative enterprise such as scientific research or democratic politics because doing so would offend one's conscience, then of course nobody can have that kind of religious faith and be a utilitarian. But there are broader and more plausible definitions of being religious. For example, it's sometimes said that for followers of Christ, love is the only law. Nothing on that account of Christianity takes precedence over the duty to be of assistance to one's neighbor, to treat, him or her need, treat his or her needs with loving kindness. Creedal statements and acts of worship are secondary in comparison to this overriding obligation. Theology on this view is not of the essence of Christian belief, for the Christian life is one of service to others. Only such service counts as service to God. To lead a life devoted to such service counts as Christian and a fortiori as being religious in the fullest possible senses of the terms Christian and religious. But a life which neglects such service, no matter how many sacraments are received nor how many professions made, does not 
If one interprets Christianity in this way, then it's possible to view utilitarianism as a reformulation of the central Christian doctrine. For utilitarianism says that all human beings, or perhaps even all creatures that can suffer pain, are on a moral par, that they all deserve to have their needs satisfied insofar as this can be done without harm to others. As James put it, I quote James, Take any demand, however slight, which any creature, however weak, may make. Ought it not, for its own soul's sake, to be satisfied? If not, prove why not. The only possible kind of proof you could adduce would be the exhibition of another creature whose demand went the other way." End of quote. The egalitarianism which runs through Mills and James's work is a moral attitude which I suspect could only flourish in a culture which had been told century after century that God's will was for human beings to love one another, that all men are brothers, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. The idea that everybody, black or white, male or female, Christian or heathen, wise or foolish, has rights which deserve respect and consideration is one which in Europe and America has traditionally been backed up by an appeal to this agapistic strain in the Christian tradition. If one does see the claim that love is the only law as central to Christianity, then it's possible to describe the historical development of Christianity in terms of the gradual substitution of love for power as the essential attribute of God. A God of power is an authority. A God of love is a friend. If one thinks of our relation to God as one of all worship and obedience, then one must insist that utilitarianism and pragmatism have their limits, limits set by God's commands. If, however, God has commanded him, if, sorry, if, for example, God has commanded us to worship him under one name rather than another, or condemned us not to suffer a, a witch to live, or commanded that women be silent in churches, or that a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, then no pragmatic or utilitarian consideration can have any force to persuade us of any different opinion. Insofar as Christians see their obedience to God as including more than the duty to serve their fellow human beings, they are worshiping a God of power rather than a God of love. From this point of view, Clifford's claim that we have an obligation to truth, that the pursuit of truth is something different from the pursuit of human happiness, is a version of the religious idea that we owe obedience to a higher power. Truth, considered as correspondence to the intrinsic nature of reality, is the secularist's, positivist's equivalent of the god of power. Science, seen as Clifford sees it rather than James does, is the Enlightenment version of the worship of a god of power. But James, by insisting that reality has no intrinsic nature to be respected, is following up on what I've been calling the agapistic strain in Christianity the strain that insists that love is the only law. In saying that our duty to truth amounts to the duty to respect the needs of those fellow creatures with whom we are involved in cooperative activities, problems are following up on this question line of thought. for its own purposes in order to reply to the suggestion that pragmatism begs the question again.
question, though, if for some reason she became concerned about that relation, philosophy in general, and James in particular, might help. The suspicion which I raised at the beginning of this talk about the very idea of intellectual responsibility is also a suspicion about the need for philosophical reflection. I think that we philosophy professors are too much inclined to quote Socrates' maxim that the unexamined life is not worth living. That maxim is true for people who find themselves confronted by live, momentous, and forced options, the kind of option which gives us a chance to change our future life in some far-reaching way. At such moments, there is indeed a need for reflection and for formulating an account of how the various parts of our life hang together. And philosophy books may be a very present help at such times of trouble, although, of course, so may many other sorts of books. But not everyone is confronted by such options. Not everyone feels such tensions. People whose lives are as smooth and as lucky as I have imagined Professor Ryan's life to be will not be. It seems to me pointless to say to such people that they ought to examine their lives, that they ought to wax philosophical. It's equally pointless <coughs> to accuse them of failure to take an interest in philosophy and to accuse them of intellectual irresponsibility. Yeah, I think that uh, part of the reason they don't get much of a play now is that we teach Nietzsche instead. Nietzsche said a lot of the same stuff, uh, and he, a lot of other stuff too. But you know, on on subjects like truth and knowledge, he pretty much he and the pragmatists pretty much echo one another. Nietzsche is a more exciting romantic figure, and so if you want to get these particular points across, Nietzsche is you know a reasonable way to do it. I think the big difference between Nietzsche and, on the one hand, and James and Dewey on the other is Nietzsche had no interest in democracy. Uh, James and Dewey were, you know, enthusiastic about democracy. James and Dewey were just nicer people. <laughs> on, the other hand, on the other hand, they weren't as brilliant writers. They weren't as, you know, charismatic a figure, so they tend to get neglected. I think it's an empirical prediction whether it would make life better for people to come pragma become pragmatists. I mean, the analogy that I, I want to use is in the 18th century, a lot of people said, you know, without the church, without religion at the center of social life, uh, society's going to fall apart. I mean, you know, we need God in here. <laughs> 
Because if people think God doesn't exist, then, you know, they'll get away with murder, uh, stuff like that. I mean, that was a plausible remark. I mean, it was an, an empirical prediction made about what would happen if European civilization secularized its politics, its art, its way of thinking. It didn't come true. I mean, in fact, we got far more secular than people in the 18th century ever thought we could get, and civilization didn't fall apart. It's possible that pragmatism would be bad for us, you know, that if everybody took this pragmatist line that I'm taking, that you know, civilization would fall apart or something. It's possible. I don't think so, but you know, it's an empirical question. Uh, do we, when he was asked this kind of question, would say, yes, maybe people are you know, sufficiently in need of a sense of being obedient to an authority that pragmatism is just not something they can live with, but still, we could try it and see. Now, that, that's just a contingency. Uh, it's, uh, the, um, there was a guy in Comp Lit who uh, thought that there wasn't enough continental philosophy as opposed to analytic philosophy being taught at Stanford. That is, the philosophy department doesn't teach people like Hegel and Heidegger much, and he wanted more courses in that stuff, so he hired me to give the courses. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a common situation in American universities that uh, there are these figures like Hegel and Heidegger whom you, you don't get in philosophy departments, so you get them in literature departments or politics departments or you know, some other place. People like me are brought in to do the, you know, do the job. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'll say that again. Um, I guess, I hope they aren't. Uh, Santayana once said that superstition is the confusion of ideals with power. That is, you know, superstition is not being able to love something unless you think it's great and big and strong and capable of, you know, doing things to you or protecting you or something like that. Uh, the, the, stuff, uh, you know, the, the stuff that people always quote from St. Paul and Corinthians about the greatest of these is love uh, is full of suggestions that love is something utterly distinct from attachment to power or you know, respect for power. You know, whatever it is, it isn't that. <laughs> so I'd be inclined to think that, you know, that that part of Christianity, as opposed to a lot of other stuff in Christianity, does separate love from power. Uh, you know, and that, and indeed, that was one of the most original suggestions the Christians made, <laughs> that maybe power isn't as important <laughs> as one might think. Well, I, I mean, there's a, there's a whole tangle of questions um, about church and state. Uh, when Jefferson tried to lay things out so that there'd be a separation of church and state, uh, I think of him as saying, let's have a country in which religion is a private matter. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's fix it so that you know you can have Jews, Buddhists, atheists, anything you like, as long as they don't 
get in each other's way. There's a famous sentence of Jefferson's where he says, it, uh, it does me no harm if my neighbor believes in 20 gods or in no god. Uh, and this utilitarian <laughs> approach to religious belief gave rise to the American separation of church and state. Uh, it seems to me the fundamentalists are saying um, the country should live in fear of the wrath of a powerful divine being whose representatives we are and will tell you when he's mad at you and when he isn't and you know you should fix politics so as to avoid his wrath and I regard this as you know un-American in the sense of you know antithetical to Jefferson's vision of America. Yeah, you said um, earlier that um, the point about Socrates, the unexamined life is um, not worth living for Socrates. And you said that people who have um, situations in their life, uh, I think you called it magnified reflection. Um, I'm not sure if that was the exact term that you used. But wouldn't you think that it would be more pragmatic for someone to learn philosophy in case they had a bad situation in life, kind of as a preventative <laughs> reflection? I mean, or should we just wait till it happens and then maybe? That's, I think it's a little like sort of assembling a medicine kit before you know what disease you have. It's, you know, I'm, I, mean, I, don't think I don't think people whose lives aren't to some extent torn, bother to take philosophy courses. I mean, why would you, after all? Uh, it's, you know, it's, pe people take that kind of course, and lots of other kinds of courses, because they feel a tension which they hope these books might help them resolve. And the tension is quite likely to be, you know, particular, idiosyncratic, and so on, and they may take the wrong course, the books may be of no relevance, but they're looking for something. And so I, I doubt that you could, I mean, I think saying be prepared for future tensions, well, that doesn't give them enough direction. I mean, did they take a religion course, a philosophy course, a history course, a literature course? You know, uh, lots of courses might be useful. Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't a philosophy course help you to, to gain access to good conversation? Like your own. Uh, but, yeah. So but if our students are prepared, they have a better chance to understand what you're, what you're saying, I would say. The, yeah, but the same goes for the history and literature and religion courses. Now, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, to take a to take an elementary course in any of the humanities is to get in on an ongoing conversation, but you can't possibly get in on all the conversations, uh, and you can't take all the courses. So, I'm not sure that philosophy has any natural advantage here. But on the other hand, I, you know, it isn't that I'm trying to put down philosophy. It's it's that I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, drawing lines within the humanities is probably pretty pointless anyway. I mean, trying to figure out where intellectual history stops and philosophy begins, or where religion stops and philosophy begins, you know, nobody really knows, and it's not not, except for purposes of academic budgets, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Well, there's, yeah, there's good pragmatic attitude, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know whether it's becoming more popular or not. I mean, it's always been around. There's a famous sentence at the beginning of Gibbon's Decline and Fall that the many religions of the empire were viewed by the people as equally true, by the philosophers as equally false, and by the magistrates as equally useful. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's pragmatism. <laughs>
I, it's, relativism isn't a term I can find any use for. I mean, I've never met a relativist. I don't know what it would, what it would be like to hold a relativist position. And presumably it would be to hold that, you know, there are no constraints on anybody believing anything, or, you know, but nobody believes that, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say that again. Uh, Would you say that it's intellectually irresponsible to believe at these times that in order to pursue one's happiness, it um, would necessarily come at the expense of another's? I'm talking in terms of global interconnections. Uh, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, I don't think you need to bring in intellectual responsibility. I mean, to be morally responsible, I guess, just is to ask to what extent does pursuit of one's own interests interfere with other people's ability to fulfill their needs. Uh, so, you know, well, let me come at it a different way. I'm inclined to say that um, everybody has some sense of moral responsibility toward at least a few people, the members of their family, you know, the, the people in their own village. Uh, what we call moral progress, I think, is enlarging the sphere of people whose interests you take seriously. And you know, ideally, moral progress culminates in taking the interests of all human beings simply because they're human. <laughs> Seriously, uh, no one has ever, in fact, done that. Uh, that is, you know, none of us go around thinking of the interests of the other seven billion inhabitants of the planet. We think of the interests of, you know, the members of the college, the members of the community, the citi fellow citizens of the country, something like that. And someday, you know, if civilization endures we may all be citizens of the world thinking about the needs of people you know, in every place on earth, but this is a moral ideal we're a long way from yet. I mean, in theory, we're all committed to respecting humanity for its own sake. In practice, the rich nations use up 90% of the resources and don't give a damn about what happens to the other, you know, the other six billion left to use the other 10%. Say that again. Peter Singer or, or Peter Unger, um, they, they seem to maybe have the, that, that ideal that, that you say that most of us don't have. Global yeah, well, yeah, their, their moral, I mean, they, they're, they're professors of philosophy, but that's not really what's important about them. And it's not that they have sort of specially sophisticated philosophical views. What makes them interesting is that they're what Posner calls moral entrepreneurs. They're, they're people trying to say, look, there are people who out there or animals out there or beings out there whose interests you are neglecting. And they stand in the tradition of, for example, the feminists, Wollstonecraft, Taylor, you know, women who said to the men, look, you haven't even noticed there are women being affected by this. And Singer is saying, you haven't even noticed that the animals feel pain too. And Unger is saying, you haven't noticed that every time you eat in an American restaurant, you deprive umpteen kids in Uganda of food and you know, stuff like that. Uh, this is, um, this kind of attempt to enlarge our sense of community, our sense of who counts, uh, seems to me, well, I mean, such attempts are the engine of moral progress. I don't think of them as particularly related to philosophy. <laughs> that is, I think, you know, the fact that Unger and Singer teach philosophy is just, you know, happens to be the way they earn a living. Uh, Harriet Taylor didn't make her living teaching philosophy. Uh, Catherine McKinnon, makes her living teaching law. Uh, 
you know, all these moral you know, you can go in for moral entrepreneurship and not know anything about philosophy. <laughs> Well, we call them hallucinations because we can't get other people to agree with us about what's going on. I mean, I, I, t I think of rationality as just being willing to be persuaded by other people's views of what you believe, you know, taking other people's beliefs into account, arguing with them, you know, hearing the other side, stuff like that. I mean, I think it, you know, rationality is just a social virtue. It isn't a human faculty. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear the last thing you said there. I think it's um, because the churches were accustomed to having more influence in all spheres of culture and life than their rivals in the 17th and 18th centuries were willing to give them. The new science of the 17th century said, you know, this is our turf, you will from now on stay out. The democratic enlightenment thinkers, the prophets of social democracy in the 18th century said, you know, we don't, like Jefferson, we don't need you in politics. You know, we, politics is a turf which the church should keep itself away from. Uh, whenever, there's an inst whenever there's an institution like the churches, which have sustained civilization for thousands of years and are told that they are no longer needed, there is going to be conflict. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it's any surprise that there is a conflict between religion and democracy, religion and science, religion and a lot of other stuff. Uh, but, you know, I. I think that the 17th and 18th centuries were on the right track, that life in the West has been a lot better since the church began losing power. <laughs> the churches began losing power. So, so like the conflict was kind of uh, made up? Or... No, it wasn't made up. No, well, yeah, I, I want to say there was a genuine conflict over who, what institutions in society were going to have the power. That was perfectly real. Then there was a sort of pseudo conflict about, uh, you know, a, a conflict in the realm of theory that said, you know, you have to take sides. You know, he who is not altogether atheistic has no business accepting Darwin. He who accepts Darwin can't call himself a, member, a Christian. You know, stuff like that. That I think was, you know, I mean, they were all. That was just wrong. <laughs> You know, we eventually found a compromise in which people could have it both ways, and the the struggle for power eventually got resolved relatively peacefully. It seems to me that this clash between the Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's a good way to put it. I mean, you, you, you could say what we think of as the progress we've made since the Renaissance is in large part our increasing ability to disjoin the private from the public so that people can have their own space to do their own thing apart from the institutions of society. And one of the first things you had to do was develop enough religious tolerance. And another of the things you had to do was, you know, keep, keep the government out of private space. And we've been working on both of those the last few centuries. It's privatize the public space and we've got rid of any kind of you know, polar car and sort of the public space been invaded sort of by privatization. Yeah, I, I think it has, yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that because there seems something obviously true about that in the United States, uh, just suggested by the fact that fewer and people, fewer and fewer people vote. On the other hand, there, in a lot of the rest of the world, it doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, they too have television and all that stuff, uh, but they still seem to take more of an interest in public affairs than Americans seem to manage. And I don't, I don't feel very sure of my facts here. And I, you know, even if I did, I wouldn't know how to account for these differences. Yeah, I would hope that we're going to preserve the sort of balance that we've gradually been working out these last few centuries. I mean, we're continually negotiating what's public and what's private. Uh, the, I mean, there, there was a, a couple decades ago, there was a famous feminist slogan, the personal is the political, which meant something like, uh, women who are beaten up by their husbands can call the cops. It's not a private thing. <laughs> and you, know, you can see the point. I mean, that, you know, when a husband says, you know, the, the state has no right to come into my bedroom just because I'm beating my wife, he's wrong. <laughs> you know, things have gone too far <laughs> in the direction of privatization. On the other hand, when the gays say, you know, uh, people enforcing the anti-sodomy laws have no business charging into our bedroom, they're right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and there isn't any great big general principle you can appeal to to say why, you know, why the husband is wrong and the gays are right. It's, but it's the kind of negotiation we're constantly conducting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you, I mean, it would be ridiculous really to try to lay down general principles about where the line between the private and the public comes. I mean, it's just, it's just too complicated a matter. And it's, you know, the negotiations on this will go on forever. <laughs> but we differ from, for example, the Middle Ages. Uh, in at least we have the idea of the privacy of the individual as a desirable social goal, and we didn't have that before. 
sciences and new religion is going to assert traditional religions, or not tra traditional religions per se, but the whole purpose of what religion serves. And um, perhaps that could be uh, something that's growing in our consciousness, because we are seeing the limits of what science can do. Per se. No, I don't think we are. Uh, that is, you know, we know that science is good at predicting and controlling. That's all it's ever been good at. You know, it never tried to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing, or you know, what was there before time, time began, or something like that. So I don't think science is hitting any limits. It seems to me doing, you know, forging ahead. <laughs> I'm inclined to think that we'll never be able to make particular empirical results in science relevant to religion. I mean, scientists who are religious write books saying, hey, I have just discovered in my branch of theoretical physics or molecular biology this terrific fact which proves the existence of God. Or if it doesn't prove it, at least it, you know, it gives one reason to, and so on. And I, I, don't, I don't think, these books come and go, but, you know, I don't think they ever add up to much. I mean, there isn't any accumulation of evidence. It's, they're, they're just sort of gee whiz books saying, here's, here's another thing we're having trouble with over here in science. Maybe, maybe God is the answer. Yeah, well, I mean, God, God is the answer to anything you have no better ideas about. So yes, in a sense, God is the answer. Sure. So philosophy may help us then think a little bit more clearly about some of these issues as not being as, when the scientist says, gee, I've got empirical evidence for something that the philosopher can see isn't an empirical issue at all. Okay. Kind of like going back yeah. to back when you did, you know, did the seminar on mind brain identity theory. Scientist isn't going to determine yeah. that issue. Well, the way I'd put it is, we developed this thing called philosophy as an academic specialty precisely because we were in a civilization with a conflict between science and religion, and we invented this third discipline to be a mediator. Uh, there's, there's people who know more about Asian civilizations than I do often say, um, there isn't anything in Asia like what we call philosophy because they didn't have a conflict between science and religion. <laughs> I mean, science came along you know, only with the imperialist powers, and science as a rival to religion just wasn't, you know, wasn't there before the foreigners showed up and brought it in. So, of course, they don't have a Descartes, a Kant, a Hegel, because Descartes, Kant, and Hegel were writing about the conflict between science and religion. They have something else, you call it philosophy, call it whatever you want to, but it isn't what we call philosophy, because what we call philosophy is this very specific mediating mission. So yeah, I, what I'm trying to say in answer to your question is, yeah, you know, this, this stuff I've been discussing this evening is precisely what they invented philosophy to talk about. So, yeah, it's no wonder that studying philosophy helps you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, thanks very much. Thank you.